Hi guys, uh, welcome to Tissues, which I believe is chapter 4. Before I get started, <clears throat> allow me to uh, tell you something else. So I just shot this whole lecture, alright, shot the whole lecture uh, on a different camera, to try to try out this different camera, and, uh, you know, an hour or so worth of lecture, did the whole thing, and put it all up, set everything back up to uh, upload, and the camera didn't actually save the file that I recorded. So what you're going to get now is me going back through this a second time, early in the morning, and boy, I just, I don't feel like doing it. <laughs> so we're going to try my hardest to make this decent. But if I seem like I'm a little irritated, it's because I just did an hour and a half of work for absolutely nothing. So I'm sorry. <laughs> With that in mind, let's try to stay upbeat. Let's do chapter four and um, see if we can make this pretty decent for you. So uh, what is a tissue? So tissues are groups of cells. Uh, that are working together to do some sort of function for the body. And in the realm of tissues, there are four that are four umbrella terms, you might say, that we need to be particularly interested in. Those are the epithelial tissues, which form the major boundaries of the body, connective tissues, which sort of hold things together, nervous tissues, which allow for communication, think about your brain and spinal cord, and then muscle tissues, which allow for movement. Uh, the key concept there being to convert uh, chemical energy into mechanical energy. That's what muscles do. Now, all epithelial tissues which form our, our critical boundaries, all epithelial tissues display the same basic characteristics. Uh, they will all, as boundaries, display polarity. Polarity simply means they have a top and a bottom. Uh, normally, the top surface, this epical surface, can display some variation. Some of these can display microvilli, like in the intestinal tract, or cilia, like in the respiratory tract. So these coverings, the upper surface, the apical surface, can display modifications. And then they'll have a, a basal surface, a bottom, if you will, that tends to connect with something like a basal lamina. It's a lower layer. The gist of this is that epithelia have a bottom and a top. A bottom and a top. Okay, always. Uh, epithelia display specialized contacts in a lot of cases. So epithelia is where we find things like tight junctions. Epithelium is where we find things like desmosomes, which are structural. Uh, these are normal things to find in, in, for instance, like the intestines, where you find these linings. Uh, your skin displays desmosomes. Uh, epithelia are supported by connective tissue. And uh, this is actually a little more complicated than you think. So when I say they are supported by connective tissue, I mean structurally and chemically. So not only, for instance, is your skin sort of held in place strongly by an underlying connective tissue which supports it, but your um, epithelia will be chemically supported by the connective tissue also. Uh, let's take two of these hand in hand. You see, epithelia tends to be avascular. Or let me rephrase, epithelium is avascular. When I say that, I mean that, that uh, epithelia does not have arteries and veins, as a for instance. Right, they, uh, by lacking arteries and veins, they have to get nutrition and water from somewhere else, and they get that nutrition and water from the underlying connective tissue. The connective tissue tends to be very much vascular, and uh, fluid and nutrients will diffuse up into the epithelium and keep it nourished. And then the epithelium will release waste and carbon dioxide, which will then go down into the connective tissue via diffusion and get into the bloodstream for exchange to take place. So these are very important. Uh, epithelia does tend to be highly innervated. For instance, your skin gives you that tactile stimulation. And then last but not least, um, epithelia tend to have a high regenerative capacity. So they can regenerate quite quickly, which makes sense. Uh, you would want your skin to be able to heal very fast if you get cut to limit your chance of infections. All right, so uh, we, we name epithelia with a simple system. The first word determines the number of layers. The second word determines the shape, generally speaking. There are, for instance, simple tissues, which are a single layer thick. And then there can be stratified tissues, which can be more than one layer thick, so two or more. Uh, simple tissues tend to be very important for absorption and filtration. They let things uh, through more readily, whereas stratified tissues tend to be in areas that are subject to high abrasion 
or areas that need further selectivity on what can pass from one point to another. Okay, so both of these are important. And further, uh, we classify epithelia based off of their uh, shape of cell. So they can either be squamous, which means quite flattened, cuboidal, which means kind of squarish. Not exactly most of the time. Normally you'll see a nucleus that's quite round and then kind of an equidistant cell around it. Those are cuboidal. It, for our purposes, if it doesn't kind of fit this or that, we'd call it cuboidal. And then, of course, there are columnar cells, and these are going to be those which are elongate. They'll be tall, and normally the nuclei will form a line at the bottom. All right, the first epithelial tissue that is worthy of our consideration is simple squamous epithelium. Now, you find simple squamous epithelium all over the place. Uh, this is going to be part of your serous membranes. Uh, you have simple squamous that forms up in the cardiovascular system as the linings of your arteries and veins. Uh, but more importantly, from my perspective, is the behavior of simple squamous epithelium in the kidneys and the lungs. This is lung tissue. Uh, what you see, these openings here, these are lung alveoli. Uh, the alveoli of the lungs are the air sacs. Uh, and when you breathe in, these air sacs will expand. And they're just covered externally with capillary beds. So you have this extraordinarily thin lining, and when uh, the alveoli expands, uh, and you, when you're breathing in, there will be a lot of oxygen in that air. That air will diffuse across this very thin, simple squamous epithelium and get into the bloodstream, and the bloodstream will drop off carbon dioxide. It's an exchange system. So by having this extraordinarily thin lining, you increase the chance of having a very fast exchange. Same story in the kidneys. So when you're making urine, uh, you have to have a very quick exchange. And what you see here is a nephron, a kidney nephron, with Bowman's capsule lining it. Uh, this, this capsule is lined with simple squamous epithelium. Uh, quick comment. So imagine making coffee. You can either make coffee with a coffee filter, or you can try to make coffee with, like, cardboard or something. It's going to be very hard to get that coffee to diffuse through, to move through thick cardboard. Uh, the reason why we use thin coffee filters is because it allows things to move more quickly. This is your coffee filter. Okay? Uh, simple squamous epithelium, by being so thin, allows for very quick exchange. All right, next is simple cuboidal epithelium. Kind of the same concept. This is a thinner tissue. It allows for relatively quick exchange, but by being a little thicker, it's a little more selective. So we find this primarily in the kidney tubules. So if you look at the glomerulus that we talked about with Bowman's capsule with the simple squamous that will be right here, all the rest of the filtrative apparatus of your nephrons, of your kidneys, if you will, it's all made out of this stuff, this simple cuboidal. And uh, you can see one cell there that is quite square, okay, cuboidal, quite square. But the idea is that these cells have very nice round nuclei, and the cells are kind of equidistant around it. They're not tall, in other words, is what I'm trying to tell you. They're not perfectly flat like this one here, and they're not super tall like some of these over here. They're kind of in between the two. Uh, ergo, we call those simple cuboidal. Uh, in the kidney tubules, these are really good and allowing certain chemicals out into the urine and then absorbing certain chemicals out of what would become urine. Uh, so this is very good for absorption and filtration, if you will. We, we say here secretion and absorption. That works. Yeah. Alright, and uh, here is simple columnar epithelium. So simple columnar epithelium is primarily seen in your intestinal tract, both large and small intestine. Uh, for my purposes, I would primarily want you to focus on the small intestine. In the small intestine, you get these much cleaner, simple columnar epithelium, nice cells, tall, nucleus in a line, nucleus in a line, all these tall cells. These are very easily, easily identified simple columnar epithelium. Uh, when you get into the large intestine, they really stretch out, and you end up with a lot of these little white spots, as you can see here. Uh, these are going to be goblet cells. And goblet cells produce mucus in the large intestine that kind of lubricates the passageways to allow for materials to move through more easily. Right? Uh, so that is simple columnar epithelium. Uh, by having much larger cellular mass, uh, these cells are able to uh, very selectively absorb nutrients, for example, from the, uh, the lumen of the intestinal tract. That's sort of the goal here. Uh, these cells are very tightly knit together. 
Uh, your intestine is not sterile. It's got a lot of bacteria in it. So these cells will prevent bacteria from getting between them and they will still have the capacity to absorb nutrients. Uh, these will oftentimes have apical modifications like microvilli uh, to increase their surface area as well. And here is pseudostratified columnar epithelium. So we call it pseudostratified for a reason. Pseudo means false or falsely, and this is pseudostratified. So it looks like more than one layer, but in reality it's just a single layer thick. Uh, the trick to this is uh, the nuclei in pseudostratified columnar do not line up. So because the nuclei don't form a distinctive line, uh, the nuclei are just all over the place. It looks like more than one layer, but I, it, trust me, every cell comes down and touches the basal membrane. Okay, and Because every cell touches the basal membrane, this is considered a simple tissue. This is a simple tissue. Now this is a very important simple tissue because of its cilia. This is the tissue which lines your respiratory passages. And by lining your respiratory passages and having these cilia in place, what will happen is the mucus produced by goblet cells in your tracheal passages uh, will collect debris as you breathe in, and then the cilia will beat and push that debris up and out of your respiratory tract. All right, so this is classic pseudostratified columnar epithelium, very good in the tracheal passages for cleansing those passages and uh, keeping the debris away. All right, the first of the stratified tissues. This is stratified squamous epithelium, and uh, we call it stratified squamous because it's obviously more than one layer. You can see lots of cells here, and we call it squamous because the shape of the cells near the end of their life cycle. Now, let me explain to you what I mean by that. Uh, the cells grow from the bottom here, there is an, a layer of cells at the very bottom right next to the connective tissue. Remember, the connective tissue provides the nutrition, so the cells closest to that are actively mitotic here in this epithelial lining. The cells are produced down here, you can see they're nice and round, and then the further they move away from the nutrient supply, the less healthy they become, they begin to flatten out, and then eventually they die and slough off. Your skin is constantly being made, uh, atrophying, they go through atrophy, they begin to collapse, and uh, eventually they will slough off and uh, disappear into the world around you. Just in the few moments that you've been listening to this lecture, you've lost hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of skin cells. Thousands by the end of the lecture. Uh, because they're constantly sloughing off as is their way. Good. Alright, uh, stratified squamous epithelium, this is indeed your skin. And it comes in a variety of flavors that are worthy of our discussion. But for my purposes at this stage, I want you to realize that this can come in a keratinized and a non-keratinized state. Now, all skin stratified squamous will display some level of keratin, uh, but some will have more and some will have less. For instance, you probably grasp like the, in inner, the inner linings of your cheek, okay? The inner lining of your cheek is a little different than the lining on your, your arm here. Okay, this, this is very different skin than the inside of your cheek. And the idea there is that the inside of your cheek has very little keratin, so we call it non-keratinized stratified squamous, whereas the skin on your arm, we would call that keratinized stratified squamous. Yeah. All right, uh, the last of these uh, easy ones, if you will, is uh, stratified cuboidal epithelium and stratified columnar epithelium. Now, stratified columnar, let's just get this one out of the way first. Uh, you're never going to hear me talk about or reference this again. I simply want you to know that it exists. I've only been able to see this one time doing histological study, and uh, that was on a male urethral slide. Like, we, we tend to think of uh, stratified columnar as kind of putting together two or more things. Uh, but regardless, it's very rare in the body. Uh, stratified cuboidal is quite prevalent all over the place, though. So you need to know about stratified cuboidal epithelium. Now, when you look at these cells, they don't look exactly cuboidal, okay? They, they look more like amorphous, if you will. What we have here is a nice round nuclei, many nice round nuclei. The cells are not flat, the cells are not tall, so they have to be uh, cuboidal, if you will. Stratified cuboidal epithelium is the tissue of your sweat glands, it, and your sweat glands are just incredibly prevalent, incredibly prevalent all over the body. Also found in mammary glands. Uh, so these are just all over the place. Man. You find stratified cuboidal all over. And then there's transitional epithelium. Now we call this transitional epithelium for a reason, and that is that it goes through transitions. Okay, uh, What it can do is it can transition from having very round cells 
to having slightly flatter cells to having incredibly flat cells at its apical surface. Uh, this is the tissue that lines your uh, urinary bladder. Now what does your bladder do all day long? It expands and contracts and expands and contracts and expands and contracts. It gets very large and becomes very small. Uh, the idea is we have to have a tissue in there that can handle that stretching and relaxation. Uh, this tissue is quite elastic and these round cells can flatten out like this whenever the bladder becomes distended when it fills with fluid. Uh, so this is a good tissue for taking the unique stresses of the urinary bladder. You also find this in the downstream portions of the ureter and the upstream portions of the urethra. So right around the bladder in other words. And now on to the connective tissues. So um, man, connective tissues are just so diverse. There's so much happening here. So there's connective tissue proper which contains things like adipose which is fat and ligaments which are, are uh, very tough unique tissues, tendons, same concept. Uh, cartilage falls into the realm of connective tissue of which there are three types which are all very different from one another. Uh, there is osseous tissue which is a fancy way of saying bone and blood. All of these are connective tissues. Now how in the heck are bone and blood the same tissue format? The idea here is that all connective tissue, tissues share a few unique characteristics first. They all originate from the same embryonic germ layer called mesoderm. So uh, when you were a developing embryo, uh, the layer which became uh, bone is the same layer that became cartilage, is the same layer that became ligaments. Uh, it's all the same stuff, the same embryonic germ layer that developed into all those things. It, it's all started the same place basically. Like you have other embryonic germ layers that led to the formation of your nervous system, for example. And uh, further, all connective tissues display what's referred to commonly as an extracellular matrix. Now an extracellular matrix right, is a combination of what's referred to as ground substance and fibers. All connective tissues display ground substance and fibers, but it can be highly variable. Like for instance, blood has a ground substance which is plasma, which is a fluid, uh, whereas bone has a ground substance which is basically rock. It's calcium carbonate um, crystallizations. Okay, so they could be very different, but it's the same concept, ground substance and fibers. Now, all connective tissues will have cells, ground substance, and fibers. You can see cells here, these little dots, these are nuclei of cells. Uh, you can see ground substance here, this is like a gel in the background, this kind of clear area. All of that clear is actually filled with a gel, which would be considered a ground substance. And then you can obviously see a pile of fibers here. Uh, and that is the classic connective tissue concept. Cells, ground substance, and fibers. Uh, now in the realm of these fibers there are three. Collagen, elastin, and reticular. Let's go ahead and get reticular out of the way and then we'll talk about the two more important ones. Uh, reticular fibers are primarily seen in the lymphatic system uh, where they assist in a role with the immune function. Immune function. So you find reticular fibers in uh, lymph nodes. You find reticular fibers in the uh, spleen as an example. And they are important because they form up this unique net-like structural system. Okay, these unique nets are very important. Uh, the idea is that if your lymph nodes are draining fluid, that's extraneous fluid from the body, as it's coming through, if there's any cellular debris there, or heaven help you, if there's bacteria there and you've gone septic, they will be captured by these reticular nets, and uh, then white blood cells can come and deal with those and call for help if necessary. So reticular fibers tend to have a role to play with your lymphatic system and, in turn, your immune system. Now, from my perspective, a little more importantly is collagen and elastic fibers. Collagen fibers are really thick. Like you can see them in the background here. These are kind of these pink fibers here. All this pink, those are collagen fibers, the, the kind of thicker ones. And uh, they are like rope. Collagen is like a rope. You pull against it, it gets tight, it goes no further. Your tendons, as an example, are almost entirely collagen. You can feel underneath the skin surface on your wrist these, these hard tendons that are underneath there. That's almost entirely collagen. Uh, elastic fibers, by comparison, uh, obviously, are quite stretchy. They can, they can stretch and then rebound to their resting length. You find these in areas that require a good bit of flexibility. Alright, next. Uh, let's see, so cells in connective tissue. 
Uh, what you need to get your head wrapped around is the terms blast and sight. Uh, what will happen normally is a immature tissue that is growing and developing will have blastic cells that are making whatever that tissue is. For instance, like a chondroblast is making cartilage, a fibroblast is making fibers, um, an osteoblast is making bone, and then we have a little bit of term variation here. Hematopoietic stem cells make blood. Okay, hematopoiesis is uh, red blood cell formation, uh, or just blood cell formation for our purposes. Uh, so we have these cells, these blasts that are making something, and uh, then there are the mature variants of those cells. For instance, like fibroblasts live in the fibers, chondroblasts live in the cartilage, osteoblasts live in the bone, and then there are erythrocytes and leukocytes, erythrocytes being your standard red blood cell, and leukocytes being your white blood cells. Okay, these are your mature bone cells, or blood cells, I should say. Uh, and then worthy of mention here is the long clastic cell. You also have what are called osteoclasts, okay, osteoclasts. Osteo, okay, if osteoblastic cells make bone, and osteocytes are mature bone cells that are just hanging out in there being done, uh, osteoclastic cells are a unique, different, wholly separate lineage. They actually come from white blood cells, do osteoclasts, that break bone down uh, when you need bodily calcium. So think about your bones as a calcium bank. Uh, when you have a high calcium diet, you will store calcium in the bones, and in the event that you need calcium in the bloodstream for other things, you can use mo osteoclastic cells to break some of that bone down and mobilize it for use elsewhere. Uh, now, connective tissue proper. The first one here is loose areolar connective tissue. Loose areolar connective tissue is just super cool from my perspective. Uh, areolar connective tissue is found everywhere in the body. Pretty much your capillary beds are just packed with areolar connective tissue because areolar connective tissue becomes the exchange boundary between the capillaries and the cells. So imagine I'm a cell and I want oxygen and nutrients. That oxygen and nutrients has to come from the blood, but how do you get from the blood to the cell? You have to cross through a medium through which things diffuse, and that medium is typically areolar connective tissue. Uh, so areolar connected tissue allows for nutrients and uh, appropriate gases to cross through to get to the cells and then the cells will release waste and carbon dioxide which have to cross back through and get into the blood. Uh, that is what areolar connected tissue is used for. Um, now one more quick comment is that there's a unique um, hydrostatic gradient if you will, osmotic balanced gradient between the blood and the areolar or connective tissue. This is very important. Please pay attention. Your blood has a lot of water in it. That's a fact. But your areolar connective tissue, are we listening? It has a huge amount of water in it as well. Okay? Uh, they are basically osmotically balanced, is your blood and your areolar connective tissue. They have to be osmotically balanced so there can be this movement of nutrients, this movement of um, uh, certain other products like gases easily through them. There can't be a net gain or loss. They have to be osmotically balanced with water. So there's a huge amount of water here held in your areolar connective tissue. Now worthy of merit here is to point out that areolar connective tissue is quite open. There's a lot of gel-like um, um, uh, ground substance here. And then the fiber types is a mix between collagen fibers, these thicker pink ones, and elastic fibers, these thinner purple ones. So the thin purple is elastic fiber, and then that pink in the background is going to be that denser collagen fiber. So you have a little bit of each inside of this. And uh, next is adipose tissue, also in the realm of connective tissue proper. This is fat. Uh, fat is an energy storage. So what you'll do is when you consume foods, if you have a little bit of sugar in there, uh, that'll just flow around your system as um, uh, simple sugars in your blood, as blood sugar, if you will. If you increase that amount, you can then store some as glycogen in your liver. And then if you have a huge amount of sugar coming in constantly, you will shunt that over and uh, turn it into fat and store it as such. Okay. Uh, adipose is good for us. It helps us to maintain our body temperature by insulating us in the cold. Uh, adipose is going to be a wonderful padding mechanism for our kidneys and our eyes. Uh, it's just all over the body. Uh, adipose is just all over the body. A wonderful storage of energy and uh, providing a lot of insulation and then protection from 
um, a, a, from blunt impacts, if you will. Even like your skin, like all of your skin has a little bit of adipose underneath it. So you can feel your skin surface and that sponginess is from adipose directly under the surface. Um, and further, quite interestingly, is the concept of brown adipose, which I think is worthy of our mention. You may have heard the term baby fat at some stage in your life. Uh, let me explain what they're talking about. Now you maintain your body heat typically through muscle flexion. So just general muscle flexion is going to allow you to uh, generate the heat necessary to keep your body and your metabolism functional. Babies are not the same. Babies have very little musculature when they are first born. They've literally been locked up in the womb the whole time. So uh, they just don't have the musculature necessary to generate heat. But what they do have is this brown adipose kind of between their shoulder blades. Uh, and what it will do is, this is just packed with mitochondria, and they'll start burning through that fat using those mitochondria. It's kind of a long chemical story, but the gist of it is that it is quite exothermic. And uh, this has the effect of warming the kid up when, it's, when the kid's quite cold and uh, helping to maintain body temperature. So it's a, a pretty neat variation that can occur with adipose. So yay adipose. Uh, next is reticular fiber, and you know this goes hand in hand with reticular connective tissue, reticular fibers. Uh, this is found in the spleen, found in the lymph nodes. You get this net-like situation, uh, which traps debris, potentially trapping uh, uh, infected cells or bacteria, and allowing for your white blood cells to track down and destroy those, and then potentially activating a further immune response. So. Uh, that's really all I have to say about reticular connective tissue. All right, uh, dense regular connective tissue. What makes this important is the fact, one, that it's dense, okay, it's very tightly packed, and it is regular. All the fibers run sort of in the same direction. Um, dense regular connective tissue makes your tendons and your ligaments, as an example. So again, you can feel your wrist, you can feel those tendons directly under the surface. Uh, you can kind of grab a finger and turn it sideways a little bit and feel it get tight or put your foot down and push against your knee. Uh, you can feel those ligaments in there getting tight. Uh, what will happen here is you can see this wavy shape to this. Uh, when you pull against a tendon, those waves go away and the fibers all align in the same direction. And it makes a uh, dense regular connective tissue section of like a tendon or something very, very strong in a single direction. Like you could take this thing and just spread it out and break it apart if you pulled it uh, on a 90 degree angle. But if you pull against this the way it's supposed to be, it's super strong, just super strong. And that is by comparison to something like dense irregular connective tissue. Uh, dense irregular connective tissue is strong in multiple directions. It's not as strong as dense regular, but still quite tough. Okay, uh, This is primarily the tissue that you find underneath your skin surface. Uh, so the dermis of your skin, which is the second layer of your skin, is almost exclusively dense irregular connective tissue. Uh, still almost entirely collagen, very, very tough, very, very strong, uh, but not as strong as dense regular. But the trick is here, again, that it's strong in multiple directions. Still dense, but the fibers are running in different directions. And then there's cartilage. So uh, there are three types of cartilage, and they're all kind of different from one another, but the idea is that they can be pressed, they have good compressive strength, uh, they can be pulled against, they have pretty decent strength when you're pulling against them, but they don't like to be twisted so much. Uh, this when we normally would like tear knee cartilage or something is when there's a twisting effect. Uh, they tend not to be innervated, and they tend not to be highly vascular. And the side effect of a tissue not being highly vascular is uh, that it, it tends to heal very slowly. Okay, slow healing is classic cartilage. All right. Um, let's see, ground substance with lots of collagen, that's a fact. All cartilage is mostly collagen. Uh, there's a huge amount of water found present in cartilage, and worthy of mention here is the concept that cartilage is made by chondroblasts. Uh, mature cartilage cells are called chondrocytes, and that chondrocytes live in small openings within the cartilage called lacunae. Uh, actually, you can see this here, this is hyaline cartilage. There's a chondrocyte, a chondrocyte, and it's living inside an opening called a lacunae, chondrocyte in its lacunae, chondrocyte in its lacunae, right? Lacunae. Now this is hyaline cartilage. Uh, hyaline cartilage, from my perspective, perspective, takes on a unique kind of glassy, smooth appearance. It's very prevalent down here in this image. 
very glassy, very smooth. Um, it's got a uniform background. This is almost exclusively collagen. It's very tough. It's got more of a, a matrix in it, so it's it's just very tough uh, and compressive. It's good at taking compression. This is the most prevalent cartilage in your body, and the reason for this is this is the cartilage that gave rise to your initial skeleton for the most part. So your fetal skeleton was almost entirely highland cartilage uh, that still survives to this day. Like your, around your ribs, all that cartilage is highland cartilage. Uh, your articulating cartilage, your, your hands, feet, and your joints, that's all uh, almost entirely highland cartilage. Your nose, like if you feel of your nose, the end of your nose where it's hard, that's highland cartilage. Your tracheal passages, if you come in, you grab your throat, you can feel that bump out there where your Adam's apple is, that's highland cartilage. It's just all over the body, very, very prevalent. Even your epiphyseal plates, which were your growth plates uh, as a younger person, those are all going to be highland cartilage. And then there's elastic cartilage, super rare by comparison, uh, only found in your ears and your epiglottis, the epiglottis being a little flap that closes off your um, windpipe, your trachea when you swallow. Um, elastic cartilage is far more flexible, as you would expect. It's elastic cartilage. And it actually looks almost identical to hyaline cartilage, uh, with the main variation here that you can see these elastic fibers in the background. All these elastic fibers take the place of some of the high um, collagen fibers. The elastic fibers take the place of some of the collagen fibers. And it gives uh, elastic cartilage a little more flexibility. Like, feel your nose and the rigidity of your nose, and then feel your ear and the flexibility of your ear. That's the variation between hyaline cartilage and elastic cartilage. And then there's fiber cartilage, which is a whole different animal. Highland cartilage is, it's got a gooey center, and then the outside is just packed with all these rings of uh, collagen. It reminds me of like a goo with a bunch of tendon wrapped around it, but this is what fiber cartilage looks like. We call it a nucleus pulposus, a gooey center, and then an annulus fibrosus, a ring of fibers around the outside. The way I describe this to people is imagine if you had like a, a racquetball, which is quite squishy, if you take that racquetball and just put a few rings of uh, duct tape around the outside, you could compress it and it would be springy, but once you compress it to a degree, it goes no further because the duct tape will get very tight and it wouldn't allow further expansion. That's how fiber cartilage behaves. That's what makes this so good in our intervertebral discs. Uh, the gist of it is that your intervertebral discs act like tiny little shock absorbers, absorbing energy that could further go in and damage your spinal cord itself. And then there's bone. So uh, in the realm of bone, you need to understand that there are cells, ground substance, and fibers. These are all osteocytes. These, are, uh, these would have started out as osteoblasts, but once they build bone all around themselves, they mature into osteocytes, which are basically, uh, at this stage, stress and strain receptors. They connect to the nervous tissue of the uh, bones. And um, where was I going with that? Osteoblast, osteocytes, okay, so cells, ground substance, and fibers. So you can see the cell, 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 cells. All of these are cells. These are osteocytes. Uh, the ground substance in bone is going to be uh, this calcium carbonate type material. It's hard, it's rocky. And then, of course, there are fibers, and the fibers in bone are almost entirely collagen. In fact, the bone is uh, over 30% collagen fiber, huge amount of collagen fiber in bone. Uh, so we've got our osteoblasts, we know about osteocytes, and the same thing as cartilage. Whereas cartilage cells have these chondrocytes and lacunae, uh, bones have osteocytes that are also in little openings in the bone called lacunae. Um, and that's really good enough for me. In lab, we're going to point out a few more parts and pieces like these central canals. You can see these central canals. Uh, these would house blood vessels and nervous tissue. You can see the layers here that are called lamellae. Yeah, we'll talk more about that in lab. All right, and then there's blood. So um, the main thing here is cells, ground substance, and fibers. Are there cells? Obviously there are. Here are red blood cells that we call erythrocytes. Is there other types? Yes, these are uh, actually just white blood cells with two different forms. There's actually a lot of different white blood cells out there. This is just two of them. Uh, and cells, ground substance. Is there ground substance here? Yes, it's plasma. It's a liquid. And then uh, 
cells, ground substance, and fibers. So the fibers in blood are actually dissolved and they come out of solution when there is need for blood clotting. So you form these fibrin clots. These are fibers that would otherwise be dissolved in the blood. They come out of solution when the blood is exposed to the air or to certain paracrine local hormones that stimulate for the fibers to come out of solution and form these clots. Yeah. Uh, then there's nervous tissue. So what I want you to notice about nervous tissue is that there are two different types of cells. These are the neurons and the neuroglia. Uh, neurons look like little kites on a string and the neuroglia are the little dark spots in the background. A neuron is the kite on a string and then the neuroglia are the little bitty spots in the background. Uh, I think about this almost like a relationship between like a rock star and an entourage. Like the rock star does the performance and gets all the love and then the entourage makes sure that everything's okay elsewhere. You know, is there food needed? Is there waste to be cleaned up? This is the relationship between neurons and neuroglia. The neurons get all the love, they do all the exchange of information and all that fun stuff, and in turn the neuroglia provide everything the neurons need. They provide nutrition, they clean up waste, they protect the neurons in certain circumstances, they just take care of everything that needs to be done for the neurons. So we have these neurons and neuroglia. And worthy of mention here for the first time, is uh, the concept of dendrites and axons on a neuron. Typically, a neuron will have a single long axon that sends messages and lots of dendrites that could receive messages from all over the place. So many dendrites receiving stimuli and then axons, a single axon sending information from one place to another. All right, and then muscle tissue. So in the realm of muscle tissue, uh, what you need to think about here is that these are highly vascularized. They get lots and lots and lots of blood flow. And uh, there are three different types. These are skeletal, cardiac, and smooth muscle. Skeletal muscle is considered striated and voluntary. Now what I mean by that, striated, it's got a striped appearance. You can see the stripes in this quite clearly. And it is voluntary, meaning that we are under conscious control of it. Uh, I can think flex bicep to my bicep flexes. I can think open hand to my hand opens. That's because those are controlled by skeletal muscle, which is voluntary. I am consciously controlling it. Now, skeletal muscle cells are also very large. They're actually incredibly large compared to other cells in the body. And as a result of that, they tend to be multinucleated. Uh, the reason that they are multinucleated is because you just never know where along the long length of that skeletal muscle you're going to need protein. So you'll have multiple nuclei, so you can make protein wherever the heck you actually need to. All right. So they are uh, skeletal muscle is striated, voluntary, and multinucleated. And again, these striations are repeating light and dark patterns, uh, utilizing the two proteins, actin and myosin, which are the contractile proteins in muscle flexion. Uh, next is cardiac muscle. So cardiac muscle looks a lot like skeletal muscle, with one glaring difference. Cardiac muscle bears what are called intercalated discs. So this might look like one big long cell, but the intercalated discs uh, delineate that as to individual cells. Cardiac muscle cells are normal sized compared to others. Uh, they're not huge like skeletal muscle cells. They're still striated, but they are involuntary. This is the muscle that makes up your heart. So it'd be a long day if you had to think about flexing your heart muscle every few seconds. Um, let's see, one nucleus per cell and uh, these cells with their intercalated discs have a unique relationship. You see these intercalated discs, disc, 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 discs. Uh, these are areas where there are gap junctions between cells. And the idea is that if one cardiac muscle cell is contracted, that'll give rise to flexion in all connected cardiac muscle cells. Uh, so the long and the short of this is that this makes cardiac muscle function as a single unit. Okay, so when the heart begins to beat, it beats almost in unison with itself. All right, uh, so the gap junctions at these intercalated discs, so the intercalated disc display gap junctions, these are very, very important. And again, striated, involuntary. By comparison to smooth muscle, so smooth muscle is not striated, smooth muscle is involuntary, smooth muscle just behaves very different. Okay, because it's not striated, when it contracts, it contracts very slowly. Striated muscle contracts fast. Smooth muscle, non-striated, contracts quite slowly indeed. And uh, the idea here is that what smooth muscle is responsible for primarily is the peristaltic motion of our intestinal tract. 
This is uh, like a, a set of rhythmic contractions that propel materials from one place to another through the respiratory tract, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, through the uh, digestive tract, I should say. So, for instance, into the uh, large intestine, up the ascending colon, across the transverse, and down the uh, uh, descending colon. So you can actually feel these motions after you eat a meal after a few hours. Uh, peristalsis, rhythmic contractions, primarily because uh, these um, smooth muscle cells bear gap junctions as well. So in other words, when the muscle here becomes stimulated, it leads to a wave-like contraction that travels the entire length of this tube. This is classic peristalsis from smooth muscle, which is non-striated and involuntary. All right, now we're going to change gears just a little bit before we get to the end and talk about glandular epithelium and a couple of other little parts and pieces. Um, Glands come in two formats. Glandular epithelium glands come in two formats. These can be either endocrine glands or excrine glands. And the main variation here is the availability of a duct through which things can pass. Think about your sweat glands. Your sweat glands are in your skin. They produce sweat. It goes up through a duct to the surface of your skin to uh, cool you down. That's a classic exocrine gland. Exocrine glands are ducted glands. Uh, think about your liver producing digestive enzymes that travels through a duct down into your small intestine. Your liver is a classic exocrine gland in that particular case. Uh, endocrine glands, what they will do is they don't have a duct like this. They're, they're just a conglomeration of cells that have uh, a bunch of capillaries around them. What endocrine glands do is they produce some sort of product. Again, think about this. Endocrine, what are they making? Hormones. Okay. Uh, the endocrine glands will produce a hormone that will be uh, made by the cells. It is offloaded out of the cell where it directly enters the bloodstream, flowing all around the body, interacting with specific target cells. Okay, uh, the main point here is having a duct versus not having a duct. Excrine glands produce a fluid or something and it's dumped out onto a surface. Whereas endocrine glands produce a hormone which is dropped into the bloodstream and the bloodstream is used as the duct. It travels where it needs to go using the bloodstream. Very different. Uh, a classic unicellular excrine gland is the goblet cell which we talked about in the intestinal tract. The goblet cell will produce mucin, which is like a slippery substance, kind of lubricates passages, and it will release that through a duct onto a surface. It's making it, it has a duct, and it releases it onto a surface. You can see these here. This is a classic exocrine gland. And uh, then there are two modes of secretion that are worthy of our consideration. Uh, these are merocrine versus holocrine secretions when it comes to exocrine glands. Uh, a merocrine secretion is where the cells produce a substance, release that substance via exocytosis, and then that exits through its duct. The cells remain intact. It's what I would consider a clean system. The cell makes something, it releases it into a chamber, which they can then leave via a duct. That's a merocrine secretion. Uh, your sweat glands do this. Your sweat glands are almost entirely water. They're like 99% water. Uh, versus a holocrine gland like your sebaceous glands. Uh, holocrine glands, the cells will produce some sort of substance like sebum from your sebaceous glands. These are the old glands of your body. Uh, they will produce that substance and the cells will make it and make it and make it and make it and make it until they get so full that they rupture, they burst. And when they burst, not only do they release the product that they made, but they release all their intercellular components as well. So uh, these holocrine secretions are releasing all sorts of things, not just... Um, oil, for instance. They're releasing lots and lots of things. So, holocrine versus merocrine. And folks, I believe that's it. Let me tell you, it's, a, it's been a long day. So I'm going to stop there. And uh, I think you have a quiz already up on this. I'll make sure that you've got a uh, mastering quiz for it as well. This is the last chapter for your first exam, which will be coming up very soon. Alright, thanks guys. I, uh, I hope you got a lot of good sleep. Have a good night. Bye-bye.